We need to take action now to become anti-racist. I'm chatting with Adele Halliday, the United Church's anti-racism and equity lead about why and how your activism and your generosity through mission and service are making a difference. It's really good to be with you, Adele. Thanks, Alexa. It's good to be here with you, too. Hey. Adele, it'd be great to sort of start with a little bit about the beginning and you know how you got into this work of mm. anti-racism and equity. Can you take us back to some, some of those early days for you? Anti-racism, equity work has always been a passion of mine. And long before I started working um, with the United Church, I had been doing this on a volunteer basis. So I've been engaged in community work, um, working with committees in lots of different kind of ways in the community. Um, and the passion grew. Um, I was doing writing, I was doing other things and realized that this is more of what I wanted to be doing on a regular basis and as part of my life's work. Amazing. And along the way, what has surprised you? What have you kind of been surprised by in <laughs> anti-racism and equity work? I think one early surprise was um, just the number of people who uh, found it difficult to believe that racism exists. Um, thought that racism is gone, where you know people talk about being in a post-racial society, and mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. uh, I think one of my initial surprises was just how many people found it, continued to deny the existence of racism and how difficult it was to have to almost convince people that yes, racism is an ongoing reality. I think it was particularly surprising for me because racism has been a facet of my entire life. I've faced it from young, young ages as an ongoing reality. And so to run into people who think that it doesn't exist was a particular challenge. And so then what is the church's role and you know, mission and services support that helps church communities come to that now what? What are we, mm. what are we doing as a church in, in terms of that kind of work? Maybe I'll just talk about the 40 days of engagement on anti-racism, which is something I'm so excited about. <laughs> Excited and about this it too. is yes, <laughs> lots of excitement. There's excitement across the church. So, yeah. I mean, Mission and Service is supporting this program. This is a 40-day program designed within, by us in the United Church, for people in the United Church and beyond, mm -hmm. that moves people through a journey. So every day, um, with the exception of Sundays, every weekday there's um, a daily written reflection written by mm -hmm. someone in the church that talks about a facet of racism and anti-racism. It might be internalized racism, anti-black racism, anti-indigenous racism, systemic racism, a form of racism that people will talk about. The daily re written reflections engage people through a time of learning, mm -hmm. uh, a faith reflection, and an idea for action. We were just talking about action. So those written reflections are things that people can do on their own. I know some people have incorporated them as part of their daily devotion and prayer. Um, so the, there's a written reflection. There's also uh, Tuesday, uh, eve Tuesdays, either in the middle of the day or in the evening, there are live events where people can come, participate, engage with some of the authors and people involved in the broader community. Um, there is discounts for the United Church Bookstore and lots of study groups and other ways that people can become involved. One way I think that Mission and Service impacts this is one, it's supported the development of this program as a whole, which has um, people across the church engaged, but also people beyond the church. So that's one tangible example. One program completely developed, supported by Mission and Service for people in the United Church, but that actually has had a global reach. Is there a story of of an individual that's been impacted by this work that you can share. When you think about the work you've done, when you think about the work that Mission and Services supported, is there a face that comes to mind? Another story, another person talked about how they picked up a resource um, that we in the United Church had developed, Mission and Service Funds, read it through, really thought about it, prayerfully reflected and said, I want to make changes in my worship service. And they started to implement anti-racism elements in their worship. So, mm -hmm. um, and that looked different and lots of that involved engaging conversation, that mm -hmm. involved looking at their church school curriculum, that involved even looking at stained glass, that looked at, you know, they talked about questions of cultural misappropriation, they made changes in terms of liturgy, and so on and so on. So that was one person, again, making lots of changes. And then there were also people um, indigenous and racialized people who felt validated by the work. For those of us who have grown up feeling the detrimental effects of racism our entire lives, mm -hmm. sometimes when we don't have an opportunity to talk about them, we might think that there's something individually wrong with us. And I feel 
personally empowered to do this work, or I feel um, strengthened to re-engage, or I felt tired and now I have energy once again. So I think um, the faces are different, you know? There's people who are engaged in change, people who are doing worship differently, people who feel a personal sense of validation, um, all of those things and more. It's not to say it's all happy and rosy. There are people yeah. who are, you know? <laughs> there are people who, yeah. you know, even as people are being challenged, mm -hmm. um, there's that there can be a defensiveness or mm -hmm. a disconnect or a how dare the church is engaged in it. And I get happy emails mm -hmm. about that all the time. Happy, not so happy, happy. emails. <laughs> saying, you why do. are you doing this? Are you yeah. saying by engaging in anti-racism work, are you saying that there's racism in the church? Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> the answer is yes, there is yes. racism in the church. Yeah. But, um, but people, there's some people who don't want to talk about that. They're saying, well, how dare you say that there's racism in the church? We shouldn't be talking about that at all. We should be focused on other things. What is it that keeps you going in this work, in those challenging moments? Hmm. And I remember even thinking for myself, you are going to get so much pushback around, um, around the work that you're trying to do. Anytime you try to engage in systemic change work, um, the system, people will push back. I remember asking myself, am I willing, prepared to do that? Um, and I thought, yes, <laughs> for a number of reasons. I mean, mm -hmm. passion for the work, but also a broader sense of call to the work. And I'll come back to the call in a moment. Mm -hmm. So one, so knowing that, um, that there was a level, knowing that I would go into this engaging and that there would be pushback, I knew that from the beginning. But in some ways I almost needed to separate my person and my profession, if that mm. makes sense. I absolutely believe without question that the Spirit is calling me to this work. It is hard work at times, especially as a racialized person to be doing lead work in terms of anti-racism. There's a personal cost to that. Yeah. There are personal attacks. It's sometimes deeply painful and difficult. And there are sometimes I end the day and I think I'm exhausted. And there are multiple times where I've actually said, I think I need to be doing something else. Maybe I'd need to leave this and do something that would be easier for my body and for my soul. Mm -hmm. And each and every time I have said that, God's Spirit has said to me clearly, you are in the right place. Mm -hmm. You are doing the right work. Do not leave. Right. I remember at one point, I mean, God speaks to us all in different kinds of ways. Yeah. And God often speaks to me in flashes of insight. So yeah. I remember one day uh, being on a prayer walk and it was almost like a prayer rant. I was walking, I was talking. I'm sure people around me thought I was absolutely, you know, I'd lost my mind because I was walking, I was crying, I was talking, I was ranting. I was saying, why, why am I doing this work? This is mm -hmm. too hard. I'm tired. I need to be doing something else. Mm -hmm. I, please let me do something else. And God's voice spoke to me, flash of insight, said clearly, you are doing this work because you are called to do this work. Yeah. And this is the cost of discipleship. Yeah. But no, I'm with you. Then the voice was gone. Right. Flash of insight, I thought, okay, I'm on it. <laughs> God yeah. is with me. This is the cost of discipleship. This is part of my journey. Mm -hmm. doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. We all have difficulties and, you know, um, but um, every time I've tried to do something else, God's Spirit calls me back, reminds me of my sense of call and grounds me in this work. And I do believe this is faithful work. I mean, I engage mm -hmm. in this work not just as a thing or as a social, but deep with prayer. Um, it's faithful work. It's yeah. church work. It's so it's deeply theological. It's yeah. faithful. It's a passion. It's it's the, of it's the cost of discipleship. It's the cost of discipleship for each and every one of us, but also for the church as a whole mm -hmm. to engage in this very sacred, holy work. Sacred, holy work. And what about our children? How do we talk to our children about anti-racism and, you know, this justice work? I'm a parent. I'm a mother of two young children. Mm -hmm. um, and my older child, when she was as young as three, um, started experiencing or talking about her experiences of overt racism, even on the playground. So how do I talk about um, the realities of racism with kids? If I don't do it, um, she's already taking these messages and running with it. Mm. But I need other adults to also do the same. If adults around are engaging children in conversations about racism and anti-racism, that's going to help all of us. So kids, when it comes to questions of race, are already noticing that kids around them look different. Mm -hmm. They know that already. Yeah. They 
don't yet know how to assign value to those differences. Mm -hmm. So they'll notice that skin colors are different, but they have not figured out that maybe one skin tone is better than others. What we can do at that young age is teach them, yes, notice the differences, do not assign value to those differences. But sometimes people will look to me as a racialized person to say, I have no idea what to do, tell me what to do and I'll just figure out whatever. And I think, oh, well, yes, there's an element of that. And at the same time, I also need white people in particular, people who've benefited from a system of white supremacy, mm -hmm. to take ownership and responsibility for one's own learning. Mm -hmm. So it can't only be always reliant on indigenous and racialized peoples to do the teaching, because that becomes exhausted, right? We're yeah. dealing with our own racial trauma, our own healing, our own internalized racism, among other things. Mm -hmm. We've got stuff going on. <laughs> so that's a question. That's a continued question. What does that look like? I know of um, a number of congregations who got together and said, you know what, we are going to take our own um, take on our own learning. And so engaged in a long-term um, uh, kind of project around Bible study, learning, engagement, awareness, and then thinking about what does this look like in terms of action in our own uh, communities of faith. And people did different things. Support circles for people who are indigenous or racialized. People can come from across the church to come gather and have conversations about experiences of racism within the church. One of the important pieces of work that the church has done recently is make the declaration to become an anti-racism church. I wonder if you can speak a little bit about that. In October 2020, the General Council of the United Church of Canada made a commitment to becoming an anti-racist denomination. Mm -hmm. um, and this was, a, I think, a bold commitment. Um, at the time, it follows decades of work on anti-racism, including an anti-racism policy statement from the year 2000. Mm. But this, I think, um, declaration was a deepening uh, and a re-engagement of the work, work that had been going on for all these years. It was about becoming, right? Mm -hmm. It's not that we are, it's not that we've done it, it's a becoming, so a kind of a journey towards. For me, it was a renewing and an engagement to continue the work. So it's, yes, we've made this commitment, and so it's, now what? Now what are we going to do? So let's mm -hmm. engage in this work in the long term. We've got lots more work to be doing. Mm -hmm. um, what's interesting is some people heard it differently. They said, okay, we've made this declaration to become an anti-racist church, so we're done. Wow. We've said it, so it is. <laughs> if only our words yeah. were that powerful. We name it and it's done. Yeah. I think we named it and we said, great, let's get to work. So. Let's get to um, work let's get to work. It's not necessarily going to look exactly the same in all places and spaces, and that's okay. I think it's important, though, that there is work that's being done um, as part of our faithful response to this call, and the work that the church itself has committed itself to do. Uh, in all of our different ways, journeying together, staff, people of faith, all of us thinking about how we can become um, an anti-racist denomination over time in the long term. I have a role as staff in, in leading aspects of this work and mm -hmm. it's also really essential that um, people across the church are involved in different ways. I'm hearing you speak about the ways in which we each have a role from you know the, the gifts that come in through mission and service to the hours that the staff put in to the many many ways that the volunteers and the lay leadership and the ordained leadership all sort of engage in the material that's provided in conversations with each other and suddenly that becoming you know becomes closer and closer to that goal right absolutely of, of being a church that truly celebrates the beautiful diversity of god the church has been engaged in anti-racism work for a long time um i myself and staff have come along um, as part of this journey but this journey has been long before me and so just want to honor all of those who have been engaged in the work long before me and those who will be engaged in the work long after me it's a long continuum there have been people who have made great personal sacrifices um, to call the church to this deep deep commitment and i'm so thankful for their faithful work um, for their commitment and for the ways in which they are leaving a legacy that goes on well beyond their years. I want to echo that thanks to the ancestors that have carried this burden, to, to those of us who are in this and this moment, and to those who will come. And a thank you to you for, for leading us in this moment. Your gift for mission and service will help support programming as we work to be an anti-racist denomination in the long term.